Today's lesson is about ultrasound, and this follows on from the techniques we've already done on x-rays and uh, radioactive tracers, and this is our third and final imaging technique. So let's have a little look. Um, we're going to cover two chapters from the textbook today, 27.6 .6 and 0.7, uh, both of which are quite short. Okay, let's remind ourselves what ultrasound is. You should already know this from GCSE. So just before I put the definition up, just try and conjure one up from your memory. Okay, so you should remember that the definition of ultrasound is anything that is of a frequency above the threshold of human hearing, which we conventionally take to be 20,000 kilohertz. It will vary from individual to individual. So by uh, by definition, really, ultrasound is any frequency above 20,000 hertz. However, that obviously goes up to an infinite number of hertz. So which range in particular are we dealing with when we talk about medical scanning? And we're generally looking at the low millions of hertz, so one, two, three million hertz. The crucial thing for you to draw a line between between ultrasound and the other imaging techniques that we've met so far is that ultrasound is non-ionizing. There is no damage caused to the patient by an ultrasound scan. No damage to tissues, um, no risk of developing any cancerous tumors down the line. Um, in fact, ultrasound is pretty much the safest of all medical interventions. It has never been shown to cause any negative effects whatsoever, even low level ones, uh, which is why we use it on such delicate things as um, embryos in the uterus. Okay, um, there's just a little graphic and we're just in this range here, which is around about the one to two megahertz range, one to three megahertz range. Okay, so now that we've familiarized ourselves with ultrasound, we need to appreciate that if you wish to produce sound, you need a vibrating object, but we can't make a cardboard cone vibrate at two million hertz. It can't move through space fast enough to do that. And so when we wish to produce such high frequency sound waves, we're going to need to a, a new technology and the new technology that I would like to introduce you to now is called a piezoelectric transducer. Okay, so um, piezo, I, Greek or Italian? Sounds Italian, doesn't it? I don't know. Um, means to squash or to compress um, and transducer is any device that transfers one type of energy into another. So in this case, we're going to try to transform mechanical energy, mechanical kinetic energy into electrical energy or the other way around uh, to produce electrical energy into um, motion. So either for a speaker or for a microphone. Okay, so how are we going to do this? We're going to turn our attention to uh, crystal lattices or latte. And uh, I don't want you to think like diamond crystal um, like a jewel, I want you to think of thin wafers of solid material that happen to have a crystalline structure, which I'll show you in a second. And what will happen is that when vibrations uh, compress this crystal structure, uh, it will produce an electric charge that can be measured, and therefore we can use it as a microphone. And also, if we apply an electric charge, we can make the crystal vibrate, and therefore we can use it as a speaker. Um, you don't need to memorize the name of any of the materials that we use for this effect, but examiners may use this name with you, so Z, zirconate, titanate, uh, remember, lead has the chemical symbol PB, so it's often abbreviated to PZT. You don't need to remember that name, but if it were to turn up in an exam question, you need to just go with the flow and not be thrown by it. Okay, let's have a little look at how it might work. Okay, so I've simplified things a little bit and gone with silicon dioxide, which is also a piezoelectric crystal, uh, but its crystal lattice is a little bit simpler to look at. So 
um, you can see in the diagram that there are some po positive silicon atoms, well, ions, and then there are some oxide uh, ones in the mix. And if you just look at the top surface of the square, you can see that there is a positively charged ion sitting next to a negatively charged ion. And so the top surface of this crystal is electrically neutral. Same for the bottom surface down here, positive and a negative side by side. So this is electrically neutral. On this side of the square, the positive ion is actually nearer to this surface. And so you might think that this surface might be slightly positive, but in actual fact, there are two negative charges a little bit further away. Now, we'll study uh, the electrostatic force more next year, but I think you know that it weakens with distance. So this single positive charge is quite near to this surface and will have quite a large effect. And these two negative charges are a little bit further away, so each of them on their own has a smaller effect, but there are two of them. And so in actual fact, in this crystal, the distance uh, reduction is compensated for by the double the number of charges. And so in actual fact, this surface is electrically neutral as well. Um, the opposite is true over here. Well, the, the opposite reason is what, but the same effect. There is one negative charge that's near to the surface, but two positive charges that are further away from the surface. And the doubling of the charge compensates the reduction in the distance. By the way, this is a physical physical size uh, for the silicon versus the oxygen, uh, not uh, a difference in charge. This is still a one plus charge and this is a one minus charge. Okay, so ordinarily, if you take a cross section through the crystal, uh, any particular bit of it is electrically neutral. However, what will happen if we squash it? So if we apply some uh, compressive force to the left and right sides, we can compress the crystal. And now when we compress the crystal, the charges haven't changed in size, but they have changed in location. And so the top surface is still electrically neutral and the bottom surface is still electrically neutral. But now the left-hand side has got one positive charge and it's two negative charges and they're all very near to this face now. And so in actual fact, this face is ever so slightly uh, negative. On this side, we have the two positives have moved just as close to this surface as this negative is, and there are two of those, and only one of these, which means this surface is now ever so slightly positive. And if we were to apply a voltmeter, a very sensitive one, between the sides of this face, it would register a potential difference. This side ever so slightly more negative, this side ever so slightly more positive, which means that if we had compressed the crystal, and we couldn't see that we were compressing it, but we could see the reading on the voltmeter, we would see the voltmeter change. And from that change, we would be able to deduce that the crystal had just become compressed. And so if we kept um, compressing and decompressing and compressing and decompressing the crystal, we would get a trace on, uh, say, an oscilloscope as the voltage varied. And this would allow us to interpret the trace on the oscilloscope as the vibrations that were stressing the crystal. And therefore, with the correct interpretation of the oscilloscope trace, we can interpret uh, vibrations of the crystal uh, and therefore use the crystal as a microphone. Okay, what about as a, uh, an emitter of sound? So it turns out that if we apply a potential difference across the faces of the crystal, the reverse happens. We can cause the crystal to flex by attaching a potential difference across the sides of the crystal. And if we oscillate that potential difference um, with the frequency uh, of our choice, the crystal will oscillate at the same frequency. So if we oscillate the potential difference at a million hertz, the crystal will vibrate at a, mil at a million hertz which is far faster than a conventional speaker can be made to oscillate. And therefore, we can produce um, a, a source of ultrasound by applying a potential difference. 
And then if we stop applying the potential difference and instead start listening to the potential difference through an oscilloscope, we can turn the same device into a microphone. So a piezoelectric crystal can be used as both an ultrasound emitter and an ultrasound receiver. Okay, you don't need to um, worry about any extra details than the one I've shown you, but do be able to describe how the change in the location of the ions, as you can see on the screen at the moment, results in a neutral thing becoming an object that is still in bulk neutral, but parts of it are negative and other parts of it are net positive. Okay, how do we make that into a device? Okay, so an ultrasound probe looks uh, a little bit like that in cross-section. So if you just focus on this part down here, this is the crystal. It's generally a thin wafer. And that's the thing that we're going to attach electrodes to via this cable. And we're going to send a high frequency signal down the cable to make the thing oscillate. And that will produce uh, ultrasound. And then we'll stop sending the signals and we'll wait for reflections to come back and oscillate the crystal. And when the crystal oscillates, signals will travel back up the cable to be detected. These signals are very, very small, very, very delicate, and very easy to uh, be completely overwhelmed by external sources. I'm sure you've heard your mobile phone causing your speakers uh, to make strange noises occasionally when uh, your phone sends out radio wave pulses that uh, interfere with the electrons in your speaker cabling. Um, so what we just need to do is make sure that this cable is shielded so that external sources of um, interference can't produce spurious signals in the cable. So that's called a coaxial cable when you shield the cable. And then what we <coughs> want to happen is that the reflections go this way uh, towards the thing being scanned. What we don't want is for um, sound waves to travel this way, hit something, and then reflect off and come back. And then we would have two sources of ultrasound heading off into the object being scanned. So what we do behind the, um, the crystal is to put something reasonably heavy uh, that will try to dampen away any of the vibrations that travel in this direction. Uh, and that prevents the reflections coming back and interfering with our signal. And then finally, on the end of the probe, we have uh, an arrangement that works a lot like an optical lens in that it focuses the sound waves um, rather than allowing them to just spread out in any direction. OK, so again, um, whenever I, I show you a, a simple picture like this, you shouldn't expect to need to know anything more complicated. But again, you should be able to describe, if asked, the purpose of the dampening block, or why is the coaxial cable shielded, or um, what um, what processes make the piezoelectric material flex to produce the, the ultrasound waves. Uh, it's just a, a couple of sentences worth of description rather than anything very complicated. OK, so we're going to move on to now how the ultrasound interacts with the patient and how we measure it. But does anybody want to unmute themselves and ask any questions about the production of ultrasound using the piezoelectric effect? OK, I'll move forward then. OK, so we now have a source of high frequency sound waves. and We are going to send those sound waves into the patient and the sound waves are going to reflect off different boundaries between different tissues in the patient. So maybe the boundary between some uh, fat and some uh, muscle, or some muscle and some bone, at the boundary between the two materials where the sound wave passes from one medium into another, there will be reflection at the boundary. And the um, the main part of um, 
this lesson today is that you need to be able to do some calculations so that you know how much will be transmitted and how much will be reflected back. So this is a two-stage calculation. The first requires you to understand, or at least to be able to calculate, uh, a quantity which is known as the acoustic impedance of the material that the sound wave is traveling through. And as the sound wave travels from one impedance to another impedance, it's the point at which the impedance changes that causes the reflection of the ultrasonic waves. So we need to be able to calculate the impedance of the two tissues, say fat and muscle or muscle and bone. And then from the difference between those two impedances, we can work out how much of the sound wave will be reflected back to the detector. So before we can work out the, uh, how the difference between the impedances results in reflection, we need to be able to calculate either of the um, impedances first. So the definition is on the screen in front of you. Uh, it's characteristically given the capital letter Z and its definition is the density in kilograms per meter cubed of the material multiplied by the speed of sound in the material. And I apologize, uh, but the speed of sound in the material is always used um, the algebraic variable C, I know you would probably prefer V, uh, but we go with C, and I know that that is often used for the speed of light instead, which is a constant and not a variable, but in this particular equation, the speed of sound in the material is always represented by C. Please do not put 3 times 10 to the 8 into any equations. Okay, so if you can multiply density by speed of sound, you'll have the acoustic impedance and you'll be able to use that for the next calculation that we're going to have to do. So just before we move on, just have a little go at calculating some acoustic impedances of some body tissues. Um, so for comparison, on the top line, we've got the acoustic impedance of air that you can calculate now with your calculator. And then beneath that, we have fat and muscle, which both have larger densities than air and larger speeds of sound than air because they are mostly solid rather than uh, a gas. So if I just pause for two minutes now, uh, and you can just tap out your calculator, it was not going to take very long because all you need to do is multiply the two numbers together. Um, just use a, an appropriate number of significant figures and use standard form if you need to. You have two minutes starting from now. That's half your time. So just to make sure you're on the right track, that's the first answer. 
Okay, how did you do? So you should have found that the impedances for uh, body tissues are quite a lot larger than they are for air. So up in the million or so uh, for the value of the acoustic impedance. Okay, so now that you can calculate um, this property of materials, which um, has a bearing on how the ultrasound waves propagate through the material, now that you can calculate Z, you can use Z to work out how the ultrasound waves will reflect from boundaries between materials with different values of Z. So let's have a little look at that. Okay, don't be freaked out by the, by the formula. It's not as complicated as it looks, and it's given to you on your data sheet, so you don't need to memorize it, you just need to be able to interpret it and to use it. So let's work our way through it little bit by little bit. The left-hand side is a ratio of intensities. So you remember from your study of waves that the intensity is the power per meter squared. So the energy per second passing through each meter squared. To be honest though, you don't really need to worry too much about the fact that they're intensities because it's a ratio of intensities. And so any units are gonna cancel out. And really what it is, is a fraction. Or if you multiply it by a hundred, it'll be a percentage. So in this particular case, you can see the subscripts are R and zero. R stands for reflected and zero stands for initial or incident intensity. So the bottom of the fraction is the total amount of energy that arrives at a boundary. And then R is the amount of energy that is reflected from the boundary. So IR divided by I zero is the fraction of the energy that is reflected. So if we multiply it by 100, 100% would mean that it's a perfect reflecting surface, that the ultrasound waves arrive at the boundary between the two materials. And if that fraction comes out to be one or 100%, then every little bit of the ultrasonic wave reflects back off that boundary. On the other hand, if that were to come out to be zero, then it would mean that the boundary is perfectly transparent and the ultrasound would pass through that boundary as if it wasn't even there. Okay, the biggest mistake that students make are to forget that it, it is the percentage or the fraction that is reflected, not transmitted. So if you work out that the answer to this is 28%, uh, that means 28% is reflected and 72% carries on through the boundary. Okay, let's have a look at the right-hand side. It's always written like this as um, a squared number divided by a squared number. But if you prefer, you can consider the entire fraction to be squared so that you have um, a difference in Zs on the top and a sum of Zs on the bottom. And so it's difference divided by sum, all squared. Or if you like it this way, it's the difference squared divided by the sum squared. Where Z1 and Z2 are the impedances of the material that the sound wave begins in and ends in. Now, I've written at the bottom that it doesn't matter which way round the two media are. Z1 is just the acoustic impedance of one medium, and Z2 is the acoustic impedance of the other medium. And the reason that we don't care is because the formula is symmetric on the bottom. And it's symmetric on the top apart from a minus sign, but we're going to square it. So it doesn't really matter whether there's a minus sign there or not. When we square it, we'll get the same answer. So we don't need to worry about whether it Z1 or Z2 are, are the the uh, first medium versus second medium or second medium versus first medium. It doesn't matter. It's just the two impedances. Difference divided by sum all squared. Okay, let's see if you can use this nasty formula, which isn't on the next page. So if you could just scribble it down 
quickly now before I change the slide. Just difference divided by sum all squared gives you the fraction that is reflected. Okay, so those are your two values that you just calculated. So what I would like you to calculate now is what is the percentage of the sound waves that are reflected when the sound wave was traveling through some fatty tissue and it meets some muscle tissue and it's going to reflect from the boundary between the fat and the muscle. Could you please use those two impedances to work out the fract, well, the percentage, multiply it by 100 at the end, the percentage that is reflected. I'll give you another two minutes to do that. another 30 seconds. If you finished, just ask yourself, could you have made your calculator work a little bit easier? Okay, how did you do? So you should have got an answer of 1.5%. So it's difference divided by sum, all squared. And in this particular case, and quite a lot of the questions that you're going to be doing when you do these calculations, because they're all times 10 to the 6, usually, you're going to find that in quite a lot of the cases, you've got 10 to the 6s on the top, and 10 to the 6 is on the bottom, and you can see that they're just going to cancel out. So there's no need for you to put the 10 to the 6s into your calculator. Um, the more complicated the um, expression that you type into your calculator, the more likely it is that you're going to make a mistake. Uh, and it just is time consuming to do it as well. So um, if you can take numerical shortcuts, don't be afraid to do so. Okay, so the ultrasonic wave is going to pass into the patient from the probe and it's going to travel through some fatty tissue and then it's going to move into some muscle tissue and as it passes through the boundary between the two uh, about one and a half percent of the incident energy uh, the intensity is going to reflect back towards the probe now you don't want this number to be zero because then you won't be able to detect any boundaries but nor do you really want it to be a very high percentage because if a lot of it reflects back, then there won't be very much left to continue on further into the patient. Ideally, you want to have some of your intensity left when the ultrasound gets all the way to the other side of the patient so that you can image all the way through the patient. If you keep reflecting back 20% then 20% then 20%, then after four or five boundaries, you're not going to have any intensity left or not a detectable amount. And so 
we do want this number to be quite small, actually, and it is conveniently so. OK, so that was uh, a, a standard calculation using this formula. And you'll be pleased to know that there's very little interpretation going on uh, in the exam questions. They generally ask you to calculate an impedance and then ask you to calculate a reflected fraction uh, or percentage uh, and then move on. That's it. However, there is a complication. So uh, I would like you to do the calculation again, but this time I would like you to consider what happens when the ultrasonic waves leave the probe, which will be um, into air, even if it's a very thin layer of air, and then enter the fatty, fatty tissue in the skin of the patient. So could you just tell me how much is reflected as the ultrasonic waves enter the patient, basically, at the, at the boundary between the air and the fatty tissue in the skin? So same calculation again, but this time use 429 as one of your uh, in, uh, impedances and the 1.34 figure for the fat for um, the other one. Two more minutes. Once you've completed the calculation, just reflect on your answer. Okay, so anybody want to shout out their answer? So shy. 99.9%. Yeah, 99.9%. .9 Very good. Um, that's a problem, right? Because you're going to try to put ultrasound waves into the patient, and at the very, very, very first boundary, right on the surface of their skin, practically the entire beam is going to reflect straight back. and practically none of it will get inside the patient. Um, does anybody happen to know what we do to prevent this from happening? Anyone had an ultrasound scan? Or see do we um, place a something over the skin which lowers that, uh, which lowers yeah, we that do. reflection? Uh, so you might have seen on TV um, that it's, it's quite common for films and things like that to show um, pregnant ladies having their abdomens ultrasound um, scans. And there's uh, a gel that is squirted from a bottle onto the end of the ultrasound probe. And then the gel um, is the conduit between the, uh, the surface of the probe and the skin. It's not air. So um, this is called impedance matching where we try to prevent the two impedances 
from being two different to each other. So if I just skip back to that equation for a second, actually, you can see down here that subtracting this and adding this basically didn't change the value at all. And so it was practically one divided by one, which is one. Um, what we need is for this value here to be different enough to this one that the difference is not the same as the sum or not even close to being the same as the sum. So rather than using air, which has a very, very different impedance to uh, body tissues, what we need to do is use a gel that has an impedance that is um, not the same as body tissues, but a bit closer to it so that the, um, the difference here on the top of the equation is not the same value as the sum here on the bottom of the equation. So in order to accomplish that, we use a, um, a semi-liquid gel, uh, a kind of consistency of hand gel, I guess, um, which you'll be familiar with at the moment. And what that does is it has an in impedance that is much closer to uh, human tissues than air does. And that allows that fraction to um, not to be 100%. And what we will find is that there will be some reflections from the skin, but nowhere near as much as there was before. Okay, um, just to note the sentence at the top, though, um, we're not just going to throw away the 1.5% uh, that we calculated, first of all, as simply an acceptable number, let's move on. When the echo does come back to the probe, the probe will measure the intensity of it. And so the probe will actually be able to tell the computer that's interpreting the signals that it is a reflection with 1.5% of the intensity. And therefore, uh, the probe can actually use that value to look up the value in a database of um, pre-measured values. And the probe and the computer program will be able to deduce that if it was 1.5% of the intensity that came back in the echo, then the echo probably was a reflection from a fat muscle boundary. And therefore, it's not just that it knows um, where the boundary is based on um, the time it took for the echo to come back, but it'll also know what the boundary is by looking at the um, the, the fraction of the intensities that came back. So um, this is high tech uh, stuff, actually. Uh, we should all be impressed. Okay, let's have a little look at what it might look like. So uh, the type of ultrasound scan that I have described to you so far is known as an A scan. And in a minute, there'll be a B scan to go with it. So it doesn't stand for anything, it's just uh, A and B. So what's an A scan? Uh, an A scan is what you need to imagine um, kind of as if the ultrasound wave is like a laser pointer bounces off the, uh, bouncing off something. It's going to be a very, very, very narrow beam that travels in a straight line through the patient's tissue, bounces off a dot of uh, boundary uh, at some depth inside the patient, and then comes back as a very narrow beam. So it's almost a one-dimensional snapshot inside the patient. It's just um, the depth of different boundaries in a straight line through the patient, a pencil thin line down through the patient from the probe. So uh, an oscilloscope trace might look like this. So remember that uh, we've got voltage up here and we've got time down here. And say that our frequency is 1 million Hertz then a pulse is being released from the ultrasound emitter every millionth of a second. So on the time axis, this is a millionth of a second here. So it sends out one pulse, and then during that millionth of a second, it receives some echoes, some reflections, and then uh, in between the boundaries, there won't be any reflected waves, and so there's uh, nothing detected. And then at the end of the millionth of a second, the um, the, pul the second pulse is emitted to travel through again. So we're regularly getting uh, repeated measurements. If the probe is kept in the same place, it'll be re repeated measurements of the same object. But if anything is moving, uh, be that the sonographer moving the probe around 
or maybe if it is imaging uh, a baby in the uterus, the baby might be moving, in which case this will pick up the motion. And one of the reasons that we have used such a high frequency is so that we have such a high resolution. So this distance here will be the speed of sound multiplied by the time um, that, that is between the measurements. And so obviously, if we have um, very, very, very short times, then we can work out very, very small differences in distance. And so this gives, by using uh, a high frequency of up at a million hertz or so, we get a really high resolution scan. So we can image sub millimeter sized um, differences inside the, the scan. So we might um, send the pulse in. So the pulse goes in and it bounces off something and then it reflects back and then the reflection gets to us. And so we need to halve this time, remember, because it's there and back. But then we can multiply by the time of, uh, by the speed of sound, and that'll tell us how deep inside the patient uh, from the probe the first reflection was, and then how deep inside the patient the second reflection was. And so this might be the front edge of a bone, this might be the back edge of a bone, and that might be the width of the bone. Okay, A scans are relatively simple. And so what we would now need to do is employ some computer technology to make this a little bit more um, useful. So what I want to imagine now is that uh, I put you inside a, um, a very dark room and I give you a laser pointer to shine around the room or, or a very, very, very narrow torch beam. And I need you to imagine that the A scan is you just pointing the torch beam at something and leaving it there. And you'll be able to see maybe where a wall is or where a chair is or, or uh, a cupboard or something like that. But you won't be able to see any detail of the wall or the chair or the cupboard because you're only um, lighting up you know, one square centimeter of the otherwise pitch black room. So in order for you to see more and build up a picture of the room, I now need you to shine the torch all around the room. And I need you to do it very, very rapidly so that the torch beam is also, it is almost everywhere all at the same time. If you move the torch beam fast enough, you'll be able to light up enough of the room all at the same time that your brain with its after images will be able to knit it together into one coherent picture. So that's what we do with the B scan. Um, the ultrasound, rather than sending out um, a single pencil thin beam, is now gonna fire out a fan of ultrasound into the patient or a cone of ultrasound into the patient. And what that's going to do is try to um, send ultrasound off in multiple directions and listen for echoes coming back from multiple directions. And from that, it will then be able to stitch it together into now a two-dimensional image. So I want you to imagine that an A scan is like a single straight line beam in one direction through here. But then the B scan is what you get when you knit together uh, a very large number of A scans. And you get a computer to take all these A scans in all these slightly different directions, and you get all of the A scans knitted together to form an image. So here you would have the surface of the patient, and then you've got some reflections, uh, which correspond to multiple peaks like these on the A scan. So every time that there is a reflection, it's colored in, and it's left black for zero percent reflected, so nothing's being reflected here, and it's it's um, a brighter white color for the more reflection that comes back. So you can see quite a lot of reflection from the surface of the patient here, where the gel is doing its best to match the impedances. It's not doing a perfect job, but it's it's doing okay. And then some reflections here in the grays, um, and then lots and lots of reflections on the baby's skull here from the hard bone. Um, boundary between that and the, the fatty tissue on the surface of the, the baby where the skin is. And then you can see that there is also some imagery inside the patient as well. A little bit of bone. Um, this like, I, it's difficult to interpret, isn't it, without it moving. That might be an internal organ or it might be the baby's arm. 
difficult to tell. Uh, that's the baby's hand. You can see the, the whiter bits inside the hand are from the reflections from the bone. And so by looking at the relative intensities, you get the the brighter the white on the spectrum between black and white and all the grays in between. And by looking at the time it took for the reflection to come back, you can work out how far along the straight line A scan it is inside the patient. And of course, it's more complicated than that as well, because actually the speed of sound will be different in these different materials. And so um, when you're interpreting the time between echoes, you also need to know which uh, medium the uh, ultrasound was in at that point between the echoes so that you know which speed of sound to multiply by. So the computer is constantly working out what tissues must have been the boundaries so that it knows what tissue the ultrasound has gone into and therefore what the speed of sound is now for this next part of the journey. So really, really complicated technology. And certainly um, sonographers have to train for years and years and years to learn how to use this technology and to interpret the images properly. You might also have seen on films or maybe you've had an ultrasound, because we can use ultrasound on any soft tissues. Um, so ligament damage, uh, if you've had a sporting injury and you've uh, ripped your ACL or something like that, or your Achilles, um, you might find that you have an ultrasound because it doesn't show up on x-rays. And although you could have an MRI scan, remember MRI scanners are very expensive and hospitals can't afford very many of them. And often there's a backlog of patients waiting for a scan and the most um, life-threatening injuries will get the scans first or the um, imagery that can't be done in any other way. And so quite often things like ligament injuries will um, not make the list for an MRI simply because the queue's too long. So um, you might have had an ultrasound if you've ever had a sporting injury. Um, and so the, the I forgot what I was saying actually. Um, what was I saying? Oh yeah, sorry. If you've ever had a scan, you will maybe have noticed or seen a film of it that the sonographer often moves the um, the probe around as well. So uh, th this is now a B scan is much more like a, a wide beam torch rather than a pencil thin torch, but it's still only lighting up a little bit of the patient. So by moving the um, the probe around to point in different angles, you can get the computer to kind of generate more of a 3D picture um, by, by shining this cone in different directions as well and getting different slices through the patient. Um, in really, really cool ultrasound scans these days as well, the computer can actually build up um, um, a memory of what it has looked at so that when the scan is over, you can kind of um, generate a, a three-dimensional image on the screen and then kind of spin it with your fingers so that it can be looked at from lots of different angles as well. Um, and if you use a really expensive machine, uh, the history can be in time as well rather than a snapshot so that if the baby was moving, you can actually get a kind of three-dimensional computer-generated uh, almost video of the baby moving around inside the uterus uh, but without a uterus. So uh, I don't know if that would freak you out or not to see your unborn child moving around on the screen as if it had been born. Okay, so um, that's ultrasound. The key part of this second lesson was to be able to do the calculations. So first of all, to be able to calculate Z using the density and the speed of sound, and then to use two different Zs to work out the percentage of the reflected um, intensity. And then for you to understand that there are uh, two different scans, the simplest one is the A scan. And then if you get a computer to stitch together multiple A scans, you get a B scan, which is probably the scan that you would be shown on the screen if you were the patient. Okay, 
So uh, what would I like you to do? So there is extra information in the textbook. So first of all, have a little read through. Um, make any extra notes that you want to, but I've picked out the key parts in this presentation. So this is the key summary notes that you need to make in this presentation. Uh, and, and this PowerPoint's available on Classroom if you want to go through it again. And then there are 10 questions from the end of the two chapters in the textbook. So if you could have a go at those uh, 10 questions um, and get back to me if you get stuck on anything. 